we have time for this question now. I have a question for both of you, but I guess I'll start with my question for you since you have a mic. Uh, <laughs> We're getting Lisa on mic here. The, the, I'm, I'm, Maybe it, it's, I can, I'm only asking you to speculate, but I would think that the neuroscientists have been pretty busy on this stuff. So my question is, what kind of neural code would underlie this cross-domain, the, the, the considerable consistency across domains that you've described, including time, which you didn't talk as much about? And um, how does that fit into this whole notion of core knowledge? So are, are we talking about an underlying representation that's similar? Are we talking about an underlying um, operation on representations that this, that's the same, or both, so? Well, you started with neural code, and then you got to something that sounded more sort of formal, so I think yeah. those are actually sort of different, um, you know, levels of analysis. Unfortunately, I don't know virtually anything about either of them. Uh, so the first one, the neural question, is what actually the Andreas Meter paper is about, uh, and Stan may also, you know, want to say something about it. Uh, they would be more expert than I. I mean, I sort of know it's the interparietal sulcus, and there you go, that's what I know. <laughs> um, in terms of formal description, um, I, I, I do think that's a challenge. I mean, I understand the question. And so, in a way, the mystery is that they are, that we do have these cross dimension and cross modal effects. What is it that's about stuffness? that is common to life and to number. What is it about all of these analog, so here when I talk about number, I'm talking one of the three systems that Susan Carey talked about yesterday, which was the second one that she mentioned. But what is it that's formally equivalent? I don't know the answer to that one either. In terms of neural codes, we don't know too much, but we know indeed that near the intraparietal sulcus there are mixed populations of neurons that care about exactly these sorts of properties. Uh, so there is number, there is length, there is size. Uh, in some images, imaging studies, there is a sense of time. Uh, and uh, they are called by mixed populations that are nearby. And sometimes the same neuron will have dimensions of preference for both of them. Well, they're not necessarily aligned, so, so that's a little bit of a challenge. And I think it's a challenge for uh, Vince Walsh, proposal right from the start, that it's not just that children will confuse these dimensions, they will distinguish them very carefully, actually, in many experiments. Right? So the final model should have all of these distinctions, and yet some kind of overarching sense of magnitude on top of it. Right. So I'm, so I'm not sure how you view that system. This is where one wonders, and I think it may be, you know, the limits of our technology, whether they're, uh, you know, if they're adjacent, but to some, at least some extent, overlapping, then to what extent, are, and I don't think we can tell quite that difference at that level of analysis. Yeah, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that coding was relative to start with. Right. And so I was wondering how this plays out in the number the way. Would you predict that children only can tell that 5 is smaller than 10, for instance, but not what 5 is precisely? Uh, is that well, in the analog number range, I mean, yes, I totally buy that story um, initially. And so that's where, you know, various people at this conference, and we'll hear more about it, we've already heard some about it, um, uh, talk about, you know, the importance of the count word system and the importance of the successor principle and, and all that for importing the sort of knowledge that I guess you have about one and two and three onto all the rest of the analog number system. I'm asking because I think from the neural point of view there is an interesting possibility here that we know there are both monotonic cells that care about increase, well, they increase their firing or they decrease their firing as there is a larger and larger number and then there are tuned cells. And tuned cells will really like to see a particular value of the continuum uh, and will stop firing for either too large or too small values. So there are very different principles of coding. And there is this very interesting possibility that the second code in the tuned cells develops as a result of having to solve specific 
problems. Uh, and I think this would be compatible with what you are saying. I, I would favor that positive of interest. I actually have a question for you. Can I, it's apropos of this. So one thing that I, I, mean, I totally believe about your data, I mean, you've shown it again and again, but I sort of just don't get it. Is this thing where they can't tell the difference between, you know, two and five? I mean, if two is in one system precisely specified, and the other one is just not in the system, it's some other large number, how is it you can't tell the difference? I, I, I sort of don't get it. Um, I, I don't, I, I kind of don't get it either, but we've seen, a, I mean, you, you know, the, lots and lots of failures to show, uh, it's not that the kids don't recognize, we have not shown that they don't recognize that they have a representation in one system, say an ANS representation, and a representation of an atomic, you know, of an object. Um, we haven't shown that they don't recognize that distinction. What we've shown is that they can't do a quantitative comparison across those two different types of representations, and that seems really, really clear. Um, right. And I don't know that adults can either. I don't think that, that question has really been asked the right way. Um, right. Um, can, can I just follow up on the Tecumseh Stan um, point? I, I think, to me, it doesn't seem coherent to say that they're all the same generalized magnitude system for the reasons that Stan said. I mean, we don't feel fundamentally confused about which dimension we're talking about. Uh, we don't mistake number for length and so on. They're, they're separable. They're clearly related in some interesting fundamental way. But just to add one piece of data to that, I agree with you that all the baby stuff shows this, you know, it looks like a common signature. You can, at six months, you can, you need a doubling. At nine months, you need a two to three ratio. But it's pretty crude data because it's success and failure. So uh, my prediction, based on one data point, is that when we look more closely with, with more fine-grained methods, we will find that these pull apart. So we have done studies with adults and with um, older kids, these are like three and four-year-olds, where we model neighbor fractions, so it's better than, you know, yes or no, you succeed or fail. And we find that they don't have, the, that the, so we model neighbor fractions for area discriminations, like how much of the blob is blue or yellow, versus how many dots are blue and yellow, so you have to make discriminations. And um, we find different functions, and there's no correlation. If you're particularly good, if you have a you know a lower vapor fraction in number, it doesn't predict at all what you're going to do in terms of area. So, you know, it's it's um, and you can even do it with the very same stimulus, so, which is cool. You can have like lots of different blobs, um, and you can either use the language to say um, are more of the blobs blue or yellow, so it's pushing a number of thing, or is more of the stuff blue or yellow, it's pushing an area thing, and you get different. Vapor fraction, you get different signatures depending on the language. So to me, that suggests that they're going to pull apart. But that's, um, you know, I think I guess it's early days. Well, and I, and, and, I mean, I, I don't know those data. I'd love to get them and to discuss them and, and etc. I mean, I think it, it matters what you mean by pull apart or what it means to be confused. So, for instance, in the days when um, you know there was the sort of clear field and mix, fights and carry and stealthy sort of you know debate, which I think we've got past in many ways. What what to me those data ultimately show is that you can push even infants to concentrate on one of those very very correlated dimensions and not think about the other of those very very correlated dimensions. It's actually very difficult. Do because as you know, once you control for one, you haven't exactly controlled for the other, so you have to control experiment-wide, not trial for trial, which I think tells you something about how deeply intertwined in a formal sense those dimensions are. So it's not that babies can't tell the difference. You can help them to tell the difference. It's the question of what in the normal environment helps them to tell the difference, and when do they know which to use, which is a different way to put the question. So I think we might agree rather than disagree, because the question is, in my mind, that of course there are sets, and of course they intersect, but how much do they intersect, and how do we help to pull them apart?
a very general question for anybody who knows the answer. So, um, which uh, scales group together and which don't? So, um, we have weight, possibility, um, brightness of light, loudness of sound, length of a line, volume of an area, uh, well, uh, sorry, an area of a, of a plane, and so on. Um, it, does everything seem to go no. together, or, or no. are there so some exceptions? Fact, I, I think it's important that some don't. And uh -huh. in fact, the Srinivasana Carey experiment, which I did not show anything about, it, used loudness, and loudness doesn't work. And that may be partly because loudness doesn't have uh, an exact zero point. I mean, there is a point at which, below which you can't hear, which varies depending on your age and the frequency of the sound. But there's not a really true zero point. Um, luminance is one that Stella Lorenko has been working with. Eh, she might kind of sort of get something some of the time with luminance, but eh, luminance is probably not in that group of those dimensions that work either. So really characterizing them, I, I think depends on uh, whether there's a, a formally specifiable zero point, uh, but I don't think we absolutely know for sure. I do think it's methodologically important that you don't always get these results because it shows that it's not an artifact of something or other. Yes, um, I would like to address a question to you about the uh, single parallel that you made between merge and this putting together or perceiving to object, which were teddy bears there. So, in merge, um, you apply this operation to two syntactic objects, right? So, these objects have features, unvalued, and first merge is generally what is not the output of a derivation, right? First merge is accompanied by displacement and other functions. So, you think that the notion of chunk is also not the same, right? A unit of computation is not a binary, a single binary branch in language, right? It's some kind of object which is like has a phase dimension, necessarily requiring more than one merge, right? So also, you know, there's a lot of experiments, uh, <coughs> human animal experiment, suggesting that when animals bring to objects together, they merge. You know. So my question is, in a sense, language, and I think in a really serious sense, language is a very unique object. Right? It has a specificity. Right? Even within the cognitive system, it's different from other things. That it has similarity, but it's different from vision, it's different from audition, it's like by, by per se. Right? So I want perhaps you to clarify for me this kind of relation what is merge has to do with you know the experiment you did. Is it concatenation? Is it something but to my knowledge is it something else than a syntactic operation that you gave a definition in terms of, of a set of formation? Um I don't know enough about <laughs> about what your definition of merge might be to be able to yeah so I, I I listed like okay here's a couple of properties that we might as, uh, agree merge has and I think that those things we basically see when we replace physical objects with the for, for the syntactic objects so I'm not clear whether you're are you are you, are you disagreeing with that 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 maybe we don't see so there's these atomic units. They're grouped. Uh, the inputs can serve. The outputs can serve as inputs. Maybe they're binary. Those were the, the 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 parallels I tried to highlight. Now, for sure, this may be going in entirely the wrong direction, which is why I said this is just you know let's just have a conversation and speculation. I don't know whether it's uh, the right way to think about it or not. Um, I think that I, I I I think that babies or adults are thinking about these representations of chunked objects as units that can then be decomposed. And I also think that there's some possible, maybe clear disanalogies um, 
but maybe you could tell me more specifically where you, you think those disanalogies are and we could have those conversations because I don't know enough about it to, to go that route. Yeah, So on the, the second question you asked about whether you can look at different kinds of uh, neural signatures, maybe of these sorts of processes, my answer is great idea. I have no, I, I have never done something like that. Um, Stan's recent lovely work gives one hope that one could maybe try to look for those same sort of signatures of constituent structure in this kind of uh, domain. But you know, I, 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 Kind of objects we are being created, and the operation of 
uh, making the comparison. So it's a really radical difference. So you may have common features for for confrontation for memory, which are taking place, and have differences at the level of the guy. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, um, I, I just think that if you're looking for these kinds of um, chunking and binding sorts of operations, it's very useful to, if you want to follow Stan's approach, try to give lots of different kinds of circumstances under which you think the same sort of fundamental computation is happening and look for commonalities. And so these are objects, you can look at lots of different ways. Um, on the first point you made, so I, I take it you're, you're talking about when about these two systems of representation being like when you have large numbers of cracker large numbers, are you talking about um, when you have approximate magnitudes versus when you have other? Right. I don't. I would say that those processes are these are common experiments and they are. They are they are based on the same kind of protocol experimentally, so you may anticipate to have a common feature for all of them. Okay, I, well, I'm, I'm not sure I completely follow your question there. What I thought you were asking originally was about whether um, you can bias, you said something about biasing the system, so I took that to mean biasing one kind of representation as opposed to another. And I guess I just wanted to say one thing about that, which is that um, I think it's it's wrong. Um, well, Liz and Stan and I wrote a paper a number of years ago called Core Systems of Number or something like that. And I think that now I wish we hadn't named it that because it's a catchy name, but it's misleading in the following sense. It, it, it suggests that there are, first of all, it suggests that um, system for working memory representations of individual objects is a, somehow a core system of number, which is a debatable sort of thing. Well, there's implicit numerical information. But it also gives us sort of a, or, um, and, 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 the, and the results of that cracker experiment or other experiment suggest is it this or that? Is it this system or is it that system? And I think that that's the wrong way uh, to think about it. I guess the way I think about it is that when you're thinking, when you're trying to represent a magnitude, one of for the kinds of studies Nora's talking about or that Manuela does, or when you look at it and you say, oh, there's about you know 30 people here, that requires the so-called object tracking system or the working memory system too, because you have to segment out what it is that you want to enumerate. Oh, it's the people in this room. People in this room is one item that takes one slot in working memory or whatever your model is. And then number is just a feature bound to that object, just like approximate color or approximate orientation or any one of many early visual features. And so you always have to have, the fundamental step is the individual or the object. The object in that case example is people in this room or the object could be crackers and another thing. You have to do that form segmenting, and that requires memory, and then you get to do computations over it. And when you decide to track features, the feature of approximate number is interesting, and we can ask that. What makes that a relevant or salient uh, feature to find or feature to compute over? Or when is it other sorts of things? And lots of different other kinds of magnitudes have been brought up um, here today. So just, just a little bit of... Um, getting away from the either or, but still the priming question is interesting. Like what primes you to want to do numerical, approximate numerical computation? Well, this wants to say something. No, no, no. I have a question for you too, but go ahead. No. Oh. <coughs> okay. Um, I, I just wanted to come back for a minute to this um, uh, possible parallel uh, between set representations for objects and, uh, and in language. Um, because it seems to me it's an interesting hypothesis to pursue, even if it turns out to be wrong. And here are a couple ways in which it seems to me to be interesting, uh, uh, even if, in fact, the underlying uh, uh, representations and computations are, are, are different. Um, one is that you guys know a whole lot about uh, uh, hierarchical uh, structure uh, in language that I think can, can frame useful questions. And, and you gave us examples, I think, of a couple of them that I had certainly never thought about before. Um, in particular, the idea that uh, the representation of a set will take on properties of the representations of the individuals. So given that you represented you know, this cat in this box and this cat in this box, you represent the set of those two cats in that box. I think that's not, an, that's not a thing that at least uh, 
I, or I think most of the baby researchers uh, I know, would have thought to even look for uh, without having that analogy. That's clearly one very useful thing that um, having a hierarchical structure can give you. Um, the second thing it might be able to give is all the techniques from psycholinguistics that can be used to probe for the nature of the hierarchical structure, like structural priming, right? I mean, if you showed kids, uh, a, you know, uh, three sets of two, uh, or take something that's at the border between something they can do and something they can't, can you, can you move them uh, further towards success by showing them different elements, you know, maybe even grouped in different ways, but with the same uh, constituent structure versus different constituent structures, I think. Uh, that could be a really interesting thing uh, to look for. And then the third interesting thing is that even if this turns out to be a completely different system, it may not be an accident if the uh, recursive properties of the numeral system that depend on things like having a base structure could actually, might actually build off something like this. So here's a uh, hypothesis that was suggested to me by your work. Suppose you take these kids that you've been studying uh, you're giving these grouping tasks to and hold on to their data for a few years and ask who catches on to the base 10 system of the English numbers faster or less fast. I mean, it really could be, even if these are initially two separate systems, language needs to be able to map on, you know, kids as they learn language have to be able to uh, map that system onto their quantity representations and it, may be really useful that they've already got a system that lets them represent three twos outside of language before they ever come into language. So it seems to me those could be very interesting reasons you know, to, pers to pursue uh, this research program, even if at the end of the day it's going to turn out that uh, uh, the analogy is just that. that there isn't a common underlying machinery, but rather uh, a parallel machinery. I'll get off the pulpit now, because I wanted to ask you a question. And it goes back to your, your first finding um, uh, that, that you shared with us, which was also the one Susan had shared with us, where you don't have sets. you just got a set of three, and you've got a set of two. How are you thinking about that set of three? Do you think there are two separate phenomena going on here? There's a limit of three on representing objects that you haven't grouped into sets, and a limit. Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting questions there. but, but so. Um, I don't think that the, that, that experiment um, tells us anything about whether babies are using any kind of merge or set binding operation there because, as you know, um, there's no evidence in those that, that set of experiments that there's any representations of the individuals that survive the computation. So um, I didn't show these data, but it turns out that because this is a foraging task, you're foraging for crackers, you don't want to get the bucket with more individual pieces of crackers. You want to get the bucket with more combined cracker stuff. So if you give babies a choice between one really huge graham cracker and two little ones, babies sensibly choose one big cracker. Their ability to do this, to make those choices over a continuous extent, is limited to the number of individuals. So what it seems like babies are doing there is going object, 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 and then potentially, but I don't have positive evidence for this, losing the individuals altogether. So I don't think there is a case yet where babies actually do succeed at finding three things together. Well, so what about the box search studies where the number of objects does matter and three go in and two come out? Right. So they represent that original three. Right. So I think that they represent that three as just atomic objects, object A, object B, object C. Um, you know, you frown at that. But there's no evidence that that, I mean, that's, that's within their working memory capacity. Um, we don't have any evidence to think that they're doing any sort of uh, grouping in that case. Um, yeah, it is a, a bit puzzling, which is again why, you know, so maybe the analogy I made is, is um, between merge and the set binding is totally useless, and I'm happy if that's the case, but it is puzzling to me why we see in the data that um, babies appear to be limited to finding these two things, right? Given, given their working memory limits, you'd think that making a set of three would be trivial. In fact, two sets of three I thought would be easier than three sets of two, and that's not the case. So there's a couple of reasons why that might be. One is if it has anything to do with if we think there's only binary merge and that they're analogous, that could be. It makes sense of a puzzle. Eh, not that convincing, but um, another is one, an issue that maybe Kara is going to talk about tomorrow or Friday, I don't know, but then other people have suggested that 
Um, well, Alan Leslie suggested that there's an atomic concept of pair diet too, and so you go around the world recognizing not one and one and binding them into two, but just initially spotting twoness. Um, that's also consistent with with our data, although you have to be able to um, do uh, set subset relationships of pair of pair or pair of pair of pairs. So um, anyway, I think that there's there's still open questions and there's still outstanding. having trouble reasoning as a baby. Um, but it, there was there was one of the box experiments where things were clustered together. The baby goes in, pulls out balls, a specific number. And at one point, it seemed to me that they pulled out more than three balls. Like they pulled out four balls and they had to pull out a fifth one in order for them to pass. That they realized there were more in there. But if babies have trouble with this one four distinction, then how come when they look at the four balls they've already pulled out, they don't get confused and give up on going in for the fifth ball? Um, well, so when one finding is that when they don't give them any chunking cues, they do show poor performance no matter what subset of the four they put on. So that part makes sense, right? The part that maybe, the, the other question is. I think the one what, I'm asking about is the one where the, they were all yellow balls. Yeah. And remember, some of them, you just called them blicks so that or yeah. they clump together yeah. so that. Right. And so, you know, you say this is a dax, this is a dax, this is a blicket, this is a blicket. They all four, the da two dax and the two blickets all go into the box. The baby's allowed to pull out two naturally. They have no idea, they have no way of re-identifying whether this is one box, that dax and one blicket or two blickets or whatever. But the idea is that they can do one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, those individual representations. And the only way they get to have those individual representations is by representing that there were two sets. And then you know that each set contained only one individual. So they don't get overwhelmed precisely for that reason because of the hierarchical structure. I mean, in adult data, it's much prettier, of course, than, than in the data. You can find that there are other signatures of this. Like when you're repeating a list of digits that you remembered in this fancy hierarchy, the pauses between the unpackings are, are diagnostic of when you're going from one level to the other. So maybe it would be great to find something like that in babies, right? I pull out two and then I pause because I'm moving to another level and pull out two. We don't have that, those kind of data, but that's what I think is, is going on there. If merge proves troublesome or unenlightening, there is another form of linguistic structure which you might see in analogy, which is phonological footing. And what's interesting about it is that um, languages show a very great preference for binary footing. So words like pronunciations like apple, not apple, chicola. There are apparently some languages which will do apple, chicola, but these have been hotly debated. And where you do find languages that seem to be having counting up to three in the phonology. Um, so romance, um, stress very often, the has to be in the last three syllables. What's really going on is that when it gets into the third syllable, they look at the last syllable saying, I'm ignoring that, and then they count to two. Um, so you need to look at how the form system works on exactly why it's best described that way. But yeah. that's the fact. So really, it's just counting to two. What's interesting, though, with Apalachicola is that once you've put it into three binary B, You've then got to decide which one is going to receive primary stress. Mm -hmm. So then you've got an operation over three tubes. So it's apolachicola, ap apolachicola, or something similar. Mm -hmm. So that begins to look a little bit like your experimental sorting out three pairs, but not two triads. We, we typically talk about syntax as putting things together. But yeah, it's very important to remember that's a metaphor. So, so what we're doing now is speaking is, is serial behavior. We're saying one thing, and we're saying another thing, and we're saying another thing. And we can say things which are 30, 40 words long and, and keep track of them. Uh, I think you're right, Lisa, in, in the privacy of objects so, uh, and chunking. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're taking in strings of words, and as soon as we can, we're translating that string of words into a representation of some object. And then, then we, we hold that in memory, not in, in, in 
can say tactic and it in some kind of semantic and, and then move on and, and try to collect the next object and then maybe collect the relation between the two. But this is a, a very specifically human skill. Um, hierarchy is everywhere in nature, but, but the kind of hierarchy that's, organi that's organizing what I'm doing now and what you're doing when you're listening to me is, uh, is of a kind which, is, which you don't find in nature. So in nature, um, typically hierarchical organization is reinforced by stimuli in the environment. So some people have used, uh, as an animal researcher who said, look, you, in gorillas eating nettles, you, know, you find hierarchical organization. So you know, typically the gorillas um, organize their, their, their feeding into subroutines and sub-subroutines. But at each point, what they do next is, is told to them by the state of what the, of the thing they've got in their hand. Okay? Um, whereas what I'm doing now is not told to me by anything. I can do it with my eyes shut. I can do it with, with no sensory input whatsoever. It's all in my head. And, and what you're getting from me, what everyone's getting from you, it is all inside their head. So there's, um, there is chunking and there's putting things together, but it's, it's of an impressively very different kind, all internal, from the putting things together that, that we do with things you know, observable and tangible. Um, so we have merge, you call it merge if you like, but any connection between the two is, you know, is metaphorical. I'm going to continue along these lines, I'm afraid, but I, I wanted to, to really reiterate what Daniel said about the importance of not forgetting about phonology, because I think, that, and, and I take partial blame for this, we've been so focused on syntax and merge and recursion that sometimes we forget that there's this whole layer of quite complex and very interestingly structured behavior, namely phonology, which isn't recursive, at least not in an obvious way, and which nonetheless, and which, which probably has much closer parallels and animals, but which nonetheless, you know, I, I think there's a lot of ways in which you could fit this into phenomenal theory. But I, I wanted to make a formal distinction that may be, well, it may be of some relevance for designing your experiments, and that's the distinction between a sequence and a set. So a set, in math, I mean, just purely mathematically, the order doesn't matter, right, so it's unordered, and it can't have duplicates. So when we look at chunking, like your FBI, CIA, CKBG, KGB, example, I just, I just, I just I do what I'm trying to avoid doing. It's really important that that's FBI and not BFI or BIF, right? So set theory says FBI, BIF, those are all the same thing. Whereas actually, in, in point of fact, the kind of chunking that we make use of, the, the order is really important. So that's one point. And the other thing is that FBIF is not a set. So you can't keep track of duplicates, even in set theory that's going to eliminate it. So I, I'm thinking that there's this intermediate set that maybe we help ourselves to the notion of set too much. Now either, so either we're being sloppy, and, and the mathematic, mathematicians would say, oh, you know, tisk tisk, you should be, the, the sets aren't ordered. Or maybe there's actually a, an interestingly intermediate level of mental organization, cognitive organization, where order really does matter. And this is now this gets back to your question. I mean, so this comes to my question about your interleaved versus non-interleaved things. As far as sets are concerned, it shouldn't make any damn difference. <laughs> but as far as the reality is concerned, it did make a difference. So uh, I, I guess what I really want to know, this is not about merge, I mean, it's, it's very interesting to try and find these parallels. But how, how much do we know about the, the, the degree to which the specific ordering, and even things like pausing you know, the details of the ordering really make a difference in these kinds of experiments. Is that something you try to control away? Is it something that someone is really targeted to see? Does it help? Does it not help? Et cetera, et cetera. what forms a really nice, clean perceptual result. And you know, you could 
you know, you could throw lots of cues at them and make it so that every which, every which feature you cared to attend to specified the same parse. That would be a super easy case of chunking. You could pick cues against each other. You could do lots of different of those kind of manipulations that sort of get at some of these questions. But the, the deep question about unordered set and ordered set. Um, so I guess I would say that, uh, um, again, maybe I'm guilty of using misleading um, terms and stuff in my own work. So the FBI case isn't really a case of set built, set binding, um, such as I, I think about it. It's a case of set binding plus something. Um, it's a case of recoding. So that what you have to do is have individual items. And at some point in time, those individual items all have to be sort of bracketed together. But then they form, they actually uh, uh, get their own identity sort of long-term memory, in which case, you know, so we, we know that I'm not a chess player, but we know that a certain configuration of chess pieces, we, we, we bind them together, and we also know that this has certain relationships with other chess plays and so on, or that FBI, but we can unpack what those words mean. It's no longer just that they're individuals, and yeah, order does matter for that level of recoding. I think that a lot of what's studied in, a, in, a, in adults, it's called chunking, um, mixes those two ideas. So I guess in the, in the I would, speculate that in the earlier stage of what we might just call pure set binding, where you don't have that recoding and that long-term knowledge that you're attaching it to, um, um, we, could, uh, we, could, we could look for different kinds of importance of order that we do in, in recoding that maybe order, you do get that order doesn't matter at that stage. Maybe. Um, but I think those, yeah. In, in your, it's, it was the one where they failed that struck me. So the order really mattered for the whatever it was, shrimp, whatever right. that thing was. The, the AB, the look at that type right, thing. Right. That's where right. they fail. Right. They change well, order. right. So, I mean, I guess it's, it's like in the seven month old data where I showed you at the, almost the end, the seven month olds need lots of support to form chunks. So, they need lots of redundant cues. It's the space and the features and the conceptual kinds. They all specify that this is a chunk that's separate from this chunk. In a way, that's what's happening in the shrimp tank case. Um, when you give redundant cues and the, the, the so, when the shrimps are next to each other and the tanks are next to each other, there's, it's an easier parse to make, right? The perception just part cuts them both in half. Um, and so when you disentangle them and interleave them, the cues are no longer redundant. So I think that's the sort of effect that we're seeing there. I just want to get back to this phonology, where the phonology is, because the, the food that the Daniel is suggesting is out actually also binary, and that the way that you can build it up is very much like merge. So in some ways, it's intrinsically not different. And in phonology, you also get to, uh, I'm actually not the right person to talk about this, I'm not a phonologist, but uh, uh, when you look at uh, prosody, when you build, up, build it up, it's still also the way phonologists are doing it. It's still doing it by binary and also do, do it by uh, level. So it's also extremely hierarchical. So in that sense, there's no difference between what you see in syntax and what you see in phonology. But that's a very controversial idea. No, I mean, uh, no, it's oh, not. Come on, come on. Trokies have been around for a long time. <coughs> Just because two, 10 years ago somebody suggested maybe we can do it all binary, doesn't mean that we can no, throw away the trokies. It's a building foot. Uh, it's yeah. binary. And then uh, if you keep on going in terms of. Oh, so, so, sorry, not IAMs. IAMs, trokies, and what's the Anapest? Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the three, the one that has three parts. Yeah. Dactyl, dactyl. dactyl. Thank you. So that, I mean, we yeah, can't just ignore you, that those things exist. Right, but then when you look those at, are people. Yeah, but when you look at, uh, when you look at prosody, uh, when you look at how you build uh, phrases in prosody, then it's also, also hierarchical and also uh, a lot of times it's also binary. So there's something in the system that is uh, binary, uh, and you see that again and again, and then uh, how you handle non-binarity is by looking at extra magical uh, things. So then, you know, you, you try to look at why these things uh, show up weak is because you take them out of the system, of the binary system. Yeah, but again, I'm actually mm. I, I agree that there is a degree of similarity that really does need to be looked into. But one of the crucial things, coming back to the least question, is um, if you're doing syntax, then maybe you need to worry about feature checking and movement and all of that. And so far as I know, nobody's ever suggested that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but there's much, there's much less of that question of licensing and moving the phonological footing. So it might just lay the bypass on all the problems. But certainly I wouldn't want a complete separation between the syntax and the type of phonological kind of stuff that is too similar. Yeah, I mean, in binary branching, Kane said it years ago, it's a way of having an ambiguous transfer. So you can use binary branching and hierarchy for, for any complex system which have innumerable elements, right? And you reduce the complexity of it. So using it for phonology, for morphology, for syntax is nice because you reduce the complexity, you reduce the choice, you limit it. So, and you can calculate things from the binary branching in a much more efficient way than not, right? But then, again, what do you identify as an object? You identify all possible objects which are in innumerable parts because they are easily tractable as binary branching structures. So what is the specificity of how children uh, do numbers or perceive or have the cognition of number and you think, well, you know, it's not just like merge, or it's just like phonology, government phonology, or it's just like a system where you represent things in a binary way. I'm interested in knowing what is specific of a language, and binary branching is a very efficient way to represent structure, constituent, units, phases, uh, bonding relation, and all these things that are significant and that we do you know, when we speak about language. You know? So the phonology the metaphor is also relevant. However, there is a cognitive, uh, conceptual, intentional part to object, right? So the phonology, in a way, does not give it all. So, I mean, we could talk about that forever, but yeah, I mean, there's a be careful with the metaphors. Okay, I think this is a good model to conclude the discussion. I thank you all for your very good questions, and we will be back here in half an hour. Half an hour.